My heart is full of sorrow. I can't believe how much I've let you down. I dread the pain that waits for me tomorrow when the sun reveals my broken dreams scattered on the ground. Please forgive me. I need your grace to make it through. All I have is you. I'm at your mercy. Lord, I'll serve you until my dying day. Help others find the way. At your mercy, please forgive me. I can't believe the God of earth and glory would take the time to care for one like me. But I read in the Bible that old story, how he pleads for my forgiveness while dying on a tree. Please forgive me. I need your grace to make it through. All I have is you. I'm at your mercy. Lord, I'll serve you until my dying day. Help others find the way. At your mercy, please forgive me. I uh, wanted to start with that song because um, the lyrics of that song, they, they speak of the, the mercy of God, they speak of the love of God, they speak of our absolute unworthiness, and yet by His grace, by His love, by His mercy, um, we are forgiven. And we're forgiven by a God who died in our place, a God who died on the cross, a God who, who died for each and every one of our sins. And I think we've, we've all been there at one time in our Christian life, um, where we've had this, this sense of, of unworthiness, this sense of, of, I don't know, messing up, letting the Lord down, letting others down, letting ourselves down. And we come with a song like that. Um, and all we can really sing at those times is, is please forgive me. And yet we know we have that forgiveness. And sometimes when things are going really well and we're on the mountain top and we think we're never going to have another problem in, in our lives, it's good to reflect that there are also times in our lives when all we can say to God is, is please forgive me. And there's something of the awe of God in that song. Um, this, this fact that, that God is so other than us. That Jesus is so other than us. And yet God loves us so much. That not only did he find a way to bring us back into a loving relationship with him. But he actually died for us that God died in the sinner's place. And I want us to, to look um, today a little bit at, um, at the, the awe of God. Um, we're looking at uh, the rediscovery of, of holiness in our lives and in our church. We, we cannot have holiness in our church before we have holiness in our lives. And I, I want TRC to be a church that realises that, 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 that holiness is such a positive thing. It's not just keeping a, a list of rules and regulations, but it's, it's somehow knowing the awe of God. It's somehow knowing that God is so magnificently different to us. And in a Christianity that, that seems to try to make us to be almost like God, the only way you can do that is by bringing God down to our level. And I want us in this church to lift God up to his rightful place. So that we are always in his image, striving after him, wanting to be more like him, instead of bringing him down to our level, whereby the challenges are so much less. I'm going to read from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Because I was... Preparing this on, on Wednesday, I think it was on Wednesday, um, God uh, speaks to us in, in many ways. And we were, we were looking in our Bible study this afternoon on uh, how we can hear the voice of God and how we can hear God speaking to us. And God speaks to us in 
very, very different ways. And he will speak to you uh, in a way that will probably be different to the way he speaks to me. And he will speak to me in, at, 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 at different times and in different places, in different ways. And as long as he's speaking to us, is in absolute conformity to his word, then it doesn't matter how he speaks to us, it matters that he speaks to us. And so our experiences will be very different. They, they will be from, from charismatic uh, um, and, and Pentecostal spiritual gifts um, down to uh, maybe evangelical Baptists where we can still hear from God. And God has a habit of using this in different ways. He has a, he has a habit with, with me that I call the three o'clock habit. He wakes me up at three o'clock in the morning and he just starts, before I can get back to sleep and say, Lord, I'm sleepy, he will start putting uh, uh, you know, words in, in, into my ear and into my head and into my heart. And I've learned never to ever say, um, well, okay, God, I'll get back to you in the morning. I'm going to sleep because I always forget what he says. I think he I think he's he's taught me this. I think he's taught me he's taught me, Pastor Rob, you had better get up now, otherwise you will not remember in the morning. So uh, I called him uh, the, the, he's my three o'clock um, uh, wake up call. And uh, I have learned to 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 get up, get a pen, get some paper, um, and, and start writing down as the Lord speaks to me. And sometimes he does that in, uh, and, and it's the beginning of a sermon. Sometimes it's something very private uh, for me. And as I was preparing the, the sermon uh, on Wednesday, um, I knew that God was giving me some, some, he was giving me words and he was giving me thoughts and he was really speaking to me about something that really wasn't quite part of the sermon and yet it was. But I knew it was something different, so I started writing it down uh, because I thought it was something very personal to me. And as I was writing it down, I realised that this wasn't just uh, in the you, this was in more of, a, of, of an us situation. So I, when I'd written it down, I, I wasn't quite sure whether this was a word just for me or whether this is a word maybe for one or two others in the church. So at the end of the, 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 the sermon, uh, I will, I will write, read what uh, I have written down and I will leave, leave you to, to, um, to just uh, evaluate it because we're to be like the Bereans, we are to judge everything. We are not, not judge in the way of criticism, but we are to look at everything and see how this conforms with the Word of God. So at the end of the, 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 the sermon, I, I may, I may not, but I may just read um, what I really felt the Lord was saying to my heart. But we'll, we'll read from 2 Corinthians, uh, sorry, 2 Chronicles, chapter 5. I'm so used to Corinthians. 2 Chronicles, chapter 5, and then Isaiah, chapter 66, verse 2, which is one of my absolute favourite um, verses in the Bible. But we'll, we'll read from 2 Corinthians, um, sorry, 2 Chronicles, chapter 5. I cannot get Corinthians out of my head. Paul. Um, no, this is Chronicles. It was not written by Paul. It was written long before Paul. Thus all the work that Solomon did for the house of the Lord was finished. And Solomon brought in the things that David, his father, had dedicated, and stored the silver, the gold, and all the vessels in the treasuries of the house of God. Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the leaders of the fathers' houses of the people of Israel, in Jerusalem to bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. And all the men of Israel assembled before the king at the feast that is in the seventh month. And all the elders of Israel came, and the Levites took up the Ark, and they brought up the Ark, the tent of meeting, and all the holy vessels that were in the tent. The Levitical priests brought, brought them up. And King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel who had assembled before him were before the ark, sacrificing so many sheep and oxen that they could not be counted or numbered. Then the priests brought the ark of the covenant of the Lord to its place, in the inner sanctuary of the house, in the most holy place, underneath the wings of the cherubim. The cherubim spread out their wings over the place of the ark, so that the cherubim made a covering above the ark and its poles, and the poles were so long that the ends of the poles were seen from the holy place before the inner sanctuary. 
but they could not be seen from outside. And they are there to this day. There was nothing in the ark except the two tablets that Moses put there at Horeb, where the Lord made a covenant with the people of Israel when they came out of Egypt. And when the priests came out of the holy place, for all the priests who were present had consecrated themselves without regard to their divisions, and all the Levitical singers, Asaph, Heman, and, Je and, and, uh, and Jedithun, their sons and kinsmen, arrayed in fine linen, with cymbals, harps, and lyres, stood east of the altar with 120 priests who were trumpeters. And it was the duty of the trumpeters and singers to make themselves heard in unison, in praise and thanksgiving to the Lord. And when the song was raised, with trumpets and cymbals and other musical instruments in praise to the Lord. For he is good, for his steadfast, his steadfast love endures forever. The house, the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud, so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. Isaiah chapter 66, verse 2. The house of the Lord, the temple, was filled with a cloud so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. But this is the one to whom I will look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. The house of the Lord, the temple, was filled with a cloud so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. We have this with the tabernacle and we have this with the temple. That when everything was finished, when all the, all the rules and regulations and commandments of the Lord were um, obeyed to the very letter, and finally the tabernacle was ready for use. Finally, the temple of Solomon was ready for use. We read that the glory of God filled the house. And with the temple, it filled the house to, to such a degree that the priests could not stand in the presence of God. The priests could not stand in the presence of God. There was an, an awe of God. And there is a real need today to rediscover the awe of God. Not because um, of, of, of a fear, and not, not because that, that uh, you know, we, we were to feel so unworthy and, 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 and so sinful, but simply because. God says, what is this house that you built for me? What, what is this temple that you built for me? Everything on the earth my hands have made. There is nothing you can build for me. There is nothing that you can come to me with that my hands have not already made. You who read your Bibles on your iPads, you naughty people, I'm, I'm joking. It's the Word of God. The Word of God is the Word of God. I, I have a paper one because I, I like paper. But, but you know, you who, who are using your, your, your iPad for the Word of God. For, and, and it's a wonderful thing. I, I was only joking. Please forgive me. Uh, it's, a wonderful, it's a wonderful thing. But you know, the, the, the very, the, the very uh, the basics of your iPad... And, and of my PC back at home and my, my mobile phone uh, that we're so dependent on. They were created by God when he created the heavens and the earth. He knew we were going to have iPads. He knew there was going to be a place called Silicon Valley. He knew we were, we were one day going to move from a computer that would have filled this church. Uh, 50 years ago, an IBM computer to, to get the most simple basic facts would have filled this church building. I actually worked on one in Ford Motor Company. And now you can have the tiniest, tiniest uh, uh, I don't know, calculator and you get more from your calculator than we got 
off of that huge computer. God knew all this would happen because he, he, he created the very substance that our iPads are made of. So we can use the iPad with a good conscience. I can use my YouTube with a, with a good conscience because God has made the very substance and it's up to us how we use what God has created. But he's saying, you know, I, well, this house, this, everything that you would do for me. Now what is it? What is it? My hands have made everything. But then he goes on for this, this wonderful, wonderful uh, end of this verse. But this is the one to whom I will look. I'm not, um, I'm not flattered. I'm not, uh, I'm not impressed by your temple. Even though God gave the instructions for it. But, but, but this is one whom I am impressed with. This is the one to whom I will look. This is the one to whom I will listen to. This is the one to whom I will speak to. He or she who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. Now that goes against so much of leadership uh, today. It goes, it goes against the grain of a lot of our Christian leadership. God, but this is God speaking. And, and, and it's, it's what God has to say that's, that's most important. What does God have to, have to say? This is the one to whom I will look. He or she who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. The humble, the contrite. Father, we just thank you for your wonderful word to us and pray, Lord, that you will open our hearts and open our minds, Lord, so that we can understand with our minds, Lord, but that also that we can respond with grateful hearts to your wonderful love. Lord, we want to have a, a big God. We want to have a great God. Because, Lord, when we have a great God, when we have a God who is so mighty and so wonderful, then, Lord, we that there is something to worship. We know that there is someone to have awe about. We know that there is someone, Lord, in, in whose presence sometimes we find it hard to stand. So let your awe and your holiness and your greatness also fill this house and fill our hearts. We ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. One of the things we need to learn from God's wonderful plan of salvation is to be struck by the awesome greatness of our Creator. We need to rediscover a sense of awe and biblical fear of God. Not a fear of God that drove Adam and Eve to run from his presence, but the fear of, of, of a father when a son or a, a little daughter has, uh, I don't know, disobeyed that causes that little son, that little daughter to run to their father. Because we know that if we run from mum and we run from dad, uh, things are not going to get any better. But uh, I would always risk running to my dad getting hold of his trouser legs, and I was very small then, <laughs> getting hold of his trouser legs and just asking for his love and his, his mercy. And I usually got it. We need to rediscover that sense of awe, that biblical fear of God. And we live in a Christian era that often promotes and encourages exalted thoughts of ourselves, but has such a scandalously small thoughts about God. And I honestly believe that there are a number of people who are getting tired of this. Who are getting tired of being told how mighty we are and how much we can accomplish and how anointed and exalted and tremendous we are. And bringing God down and bringing Christ down almost to our level. So we even hear the sometimes. You are as much Jesus as Jesus is Jesus. Please don't say that to me. 
Because I would have to have a pathetic Jesus, and I don't. There is a generation that I fear will be remembered as the age of the God shrinkers. But I believe there has to come a counter revolution against this. There has to come a revolution where we exalt God above everything. Where we lift God up to the God of His Word, the God of the Bible. I don't want our generation to be remembered as the age of the God shrinkers. Because we live in a generation that exalts man to a place that only God inhabits. And in order to do that, we have reconstructed, scaled down theologies in order to justify our dreadful pride and deceit. And we alter our theology. And so there is a little place for the sovereignty of God. I'm not going to name him, but there is a very, very famous, and I'll, I'll tell you afterwards if you want to know, very famous preacher who says, God is sovereign, but he's not in control. We are in control. We are God's men, we are God's women, and we are in, he is sovereign, but he's not in control. If he was in control, there would have never have been uh, a Second World War and an extermination of the Jews. But it's a reconstructed, scaled down theology that sounds good to some, not to me. But it's based on a dreadful pride and deceit. And a number of new movements have come and gone over the past 30 years. And each movement has emphasised subjective experiences over biblical truth. And I believe in subjective experiences. Please don't get me wrong. I believe that we should be having experiences of God and experiences of the Holy Spirit that we, we cannot explain. We should have God waking us up at 3 o'clock in the morning with words that are coming directly from Him. I mean, no way wanting to do away with our wonderful subjective experiences. But never over biblical truth. If ever I say anything from this pulpit, that cannot be completely uh, founded and grounded in Scripture. Please come and tell me, because I need to be to be told that. In the middle of the briefing, or after uh, afterwards, preferably. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but much of the Christian church today is concerned with how it feels, rather than is it true. But we mustn't become discouraged or negative. We have a, a mighty God to worship, a glorious gospel to declare, a wonderful saviour to adorn, and a blessed Holy Spirit who lives in our hearts and lives. So let us be in awe of God. He is the Holy One. He is the Sovereign God and Lord. He is God who chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. He is God who called us to himself simply because he loves us. He's the God who has given us the second birth. He saved us. He converted us. He has reconciled us to himself, as we heard last week. And then he's adopted us as his own beloved children. He's transformed our lives and our motives and our interests. He has declared us righteous so that there is no condemnation for anyone who is in Christ Jesus. Yes, we, we should feel, in a way, unworthy. Yes, we should always have a humility before God. Yes, we should always uh, tremble at His Word, be contrite in spirit, and humble ourselves before Him. But never with an inferiority complex. Never, never with a feeling that I'm not good enough because God has declared us good enough. He has declared us righteous. He who knew no sin was made sin for us so that in Him we would become the righteousness of God in Christ. He has made us holy. He has made us holy. And, and it's wonderful because, you know, we... we as I was saying last week, I think probably the doctrine of all doctrines that has uh, that has 
I think marked this church over the last three years is, is holiness. And God has made us holy. And if we have a desire to be holy, if we have a desire to live consecrated lives, if we want to live separate lives from the spirit of this world, if we just want to please God in everything and obey God in everything, in you know, the small and, 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 and the, the large things, it is a, a wonderful, wonderful uh, attribute of, of, of God to follow after. God is holy and he has made us holy. And that is a privilege. It means that God has created us, recreated us to be like him. And so we can be, be holy. But then we can't have any pride in it. Because he has made you holy. He has set us apart to be his own people. He has made us the people of the cross. He has made us complete in him. He has baptised us into his church. And the result of salvation is a new affection, a new relationship. Our creator has become our redeemer. He's the creator of all mankind, but he is the redeemer of those that he has chosen and called to himself and saved. And we are born again. And this plan of salvation sets before us a God that, that I think many Christians know, know very little about. Because he is the holy God. He is the sovereign God. He is the God of transcendent majesty. He's the God of infinite wisdom and power. And we need to study his attributes. Get a good book on the attributes of God. Or get a good systematic theology where you, where you have that, the attributes of God. He knew from all eternity what fallen, sinful humanity's plight would be. We were speaking about this um, in the, the, the Bible group. And before he had created a single thing, he had already planned to perfection and to the smallest detail how he would save not only me, not only you, but every single one of the billions of people he has sovereignly resolved to bring to glory. He will bring many sons, and if you're a lady, okay, many sons and daughters to glory. One day we will all be sons. There'll be no male and female. We, we will all be um, exactly alike. His word tells me that he has a magnificent plan of salvation. A vast program of, of, of details. Through, first, throughout the Old Testament that would finally result in the first coming of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And everything we read in, in, in the, the Old Testament, you know, it, it's looking forward. Even from the fall of man. And God declares that the, that the, 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 the seed of the woman will crush the head of the of, of, of the serpent. And then throughout the Old Testament, we have prophecy after prophecy. We, 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 we have this wonderful promise of the Messiah, the Christ, the Anointed One, who would come, not just to save the Jewish people, but to save all the nations of the world, to bring billions of people to glory. And this finally results in the first coming of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And then his word tells me throughout the New Testament, throughout the Gospels and throughout the, the letters, and throughout the book of Revelation, it tells me in the New Testament, the world history, worldwide evangelization, the wonderful mission of the Gospel, the Gospel of the Cross of Christ, that it would embrace all cultures, all peoples, all languages, saving sinners for all eternity and building his church before the Saviour returns. So that every tongue, every nation, every, every people will, will have a people praising and worshipping the Lord. The Bible tells me that the Father sent the Son to redeem us, to pay the price, to redeem, to, 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 to buy our freedom. And the Father sent the Spirit to quicken us. 
We are redeemed by the Son. We are quickened by the Spirit. We were the lost and, and sinful living dead. Dead souls. Dead in trespasses and sins. Dead in spirit. Proud, corrupt and depraved in our hearts. And that's what I was like. I wasn't even looking for God when I got saved. Some people, as I said, you know, God is a sovereign God, and just as He, just as He speaks to us uh, individually and, and uniquely, He saves us individually and uniquely. He saves the alcoholic who, who from a life of, of, of alcohol or drug abuse or, or, or life of crime, comes and, and in a dramatic way is wonderfully born again. And, and you know, we just listen to the. So to, the, to the testimony, we 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 we, we buy that buy the, the DVD or or, or 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 the CD, and I was amazed at the grace of God in saving such people, such sinners. And then you have the five-year-old girl in in, in, in Sunday school, or four, even four-year-old girl in Sunday school, and, and the Sunday school teacher says, uh, "Is there anybody here who wants to receive Jesus?" And a little hand goes up from a four-year-old. Yes, I will. And she's ignored because uh, the, the, the Sunday school teacher was thinking that uh, you know, we're the eight and nine and ten year olds and this, this four year old's hand is up and it remains up. You know, I, I want to receive Jesus. I want to receive Jesus. And finally, the, the, the Sunday school teacher prays with her to receive Jesus. She's four years of age. She'll never be an alcoholic. She'll never be a drug addict. But she's as equally and wonderfully saved as they are. And then Esther meets Michael, and they go to Bible school, to missionary college, to Indonesia, and uh, Esther becomes Esther Ross Watson. Four years of age, she is saved. Four years of age, and she goes to the mission field. God is, is suffering. And then he gets hold of me. I'm a buyer, and I've got a really, really good job in London. I'm, I'm working for a company that basically owns uh, Guyana, South America. Um, we have uh, seven sugar estates and basically that's all there is in Guyana. We basically at the time owned Guyana until they nationalised us. And now I am with a, a job where I'm travelling the world and, and I'm really having a great time and I've got a good salary and I'm planning everything and the last thing I want in my life is God. I really, in fact, you know, I see a street preacher and I walk across the road and then I come back again afterwards. I will do anything to avoid being confronted with religion. And within a few months, I'm born again. And so, is there, is there any limit to the power of God in salvation? Drug addicts, alcoholics, criminals, little, little, tiny children... Men and women who are just looking forward to a great career and are as selfish as they come have no real <laughs> thought for anybody else in this earth. I think sometimes the business people are the worst, you know, with the, with the most selfish of all. And yet God saves us. We were lost. We were the living dead. And he has redeemed us and he has quickened us by his spirit. The Bible tells me that God, the eternal word, emptied himself. I can't ever get my, I can't quite understand this. This is the most wonderful part of salvation. He emptied himself. He became nothing. This is God. This is the God who created us. This is the God who, who basically says, uh, you know, you can't do anything. What, what is this, this temple that you've built for me? It is nothing. My hands have made everything. He's the creator of the world. The eternal word became flesh. Not just became flesh, but he emptied himself of his glory. And he became a man, humbling himself to death on the cross in order to save me, in order to save you. He gets nothing out of this. He He's the perfect, absolute God before any salvation. He's the perfect, absolute God after any salvation. And we have had nothing to him because he could not be God 
If he had one single need, he would not be God. He would be less than God. He emptied himself. In order to save me. Not a good, worthy, holy and righteous deserving saint. But a corrupt, proud, wretched sinner. Even an enemy of God. As the word of God says. And he emptied himself. And he saved me. He suffered and died in agony. In order to bring me to glory. He has forgiven me. He bled for me. He died for me. And you can say me, me, me. Us. He saved me, he declared me righteous, adopted me into his family and baptised me into the church. And there is more. His plan for you, his plan for me, it reaches into the future and beyond that to all eternity. It promises us a new undying eternal body. It promises saved sinners like you and me, a new heaven and a new earth, a perfect redeemed society of believers where we will experience the most glorious fellowship together with the visible presence of Jesus for us to enjoy forever. And we add nothing to him. That's the wonder of it all. There is this wonderful future for billions of, of, of people and we will be like him. We are sons of God. He's the son of God, but we are also. Jesus said, I go to my father, now your father. I go to my God, your God. We have everything and we have given him nothing. He doesn't need us. I like to think he does sometimes. You know, I have those moments. You know, we will well, we have those moments, you know, where I kind of, you know, I, I forget that he doesn't need me. And, I, and, and I, I forget that, you know, my, my whole ministry, 45 years, has added nothing to him whatsoever. But his plan. It reaches into the future and beyond for all eternity. It promises you a new, undying, eternal body. It promises safe sinners like you and me, a new heaven and a new earth, this perfect redeemed society. And we'll have that visible presence of Jesus forever. And God has revealed all this wonderful truth to us now. God wants us to know this truth now. God wants us to dwell on all the wonders of his plan of salvation. We need to dwell on these great and awesome realities until we are awestruck at the greatness of our God. Because that's what God wants. He wants us to be awestruck. He wants us to, to, to just be gripped by Him. In the same way when we... we Yes, I can remember um, that far back. We meet a young lady, you know, we meet a young man and, and we're awestruck, you know. And, and we think that that young man or that young lady never does anything wrong. You know, uh, why are we tired of any criticism? You know, that young lady and young, we never d does anything wrong and we're simply awestruck. We, we don't see more than, than what we want to see. And then gradually we, we find out that they are also human. Uh, but we can be all struck with God and there'll never be any finding out that he's, that, that, that he's human any, any more than that he took upon himself perfect humanity in order to save us. God wants us to dwell on that plan and to be all struck at the greatness of our God. Just a glimpse of his full plan for your life should call you to awe, to reverence and to holiness. It should destroy our deadly pride, which will always come back. That's why we have to put it to death again. We never get rid of pride for good. It's, it's going to be there until we are in glory. It should make us long for a greater holiness, a greater humility, a greater sense of awe. And it should awaken in us something of the mystery of God. There should always be a mystery about God. Don't worry that you 
feel that you don't know enough about God. Don't worry that you feel you don't know enough of God, even though you've read your Bible and you've listened to sermons and you love to, uh, you know, you love to have Bible studies, because you will, there will always be this mystery in God. I believe even when we are in glory, we will still be discovering things every day. That God will always be uh, this wonderful, glorious, loving Heavenly Father with a, a, a little bit of mystery about Him. So let's have some mystery about our God. Only when we are first silenced into submission will we begin to learn how to give Him glory that is more than just lip service. I, I have sinned with my lip service to God. Um, as a preacher you get to know um, uh, to some degree to say the right things and, and to give the right responses and uh, um, you know, I've, we learn we, we learn to be professional prayers and, and professional worshippers because it's expected of the the, the, the pastor. But I, I, I want to get past lip service and learn how to give him glory that is more than that because God is worthy of our praise. The God of our salvation is worthy of our praise. He is the eternal God. He has all power and all knowledge. He's unchangeable. He's just. He's holy. He's wise. He's loving. Uh, and He is our Redeemer. And knowing God will lead to an awe of God and a desire for holiness. And this will lead to our praise and worship, not just for an hour on Sunday, but throughout the weeks, the days and the years. And every generation loses something of the awe and the fear of God. We become familiar with the things of God. This was something that God would not tolerate in the Old Testament. You, you, you dare not become familiar with the things of God if you're, uh, if you're uh, in the uh, Aaronic priesthood. He would strike you dead on the spot. As Aaron's two, two of Aaron's sons found out to their cost. We need to regain some of that, that awe and that fear of God. There's nothing wrong with the mega church. There's nothing wrong with the mega ministry. As long as we are little impressed with men, but greatly impressed by God. God is still speaking through his word. God is still speaking by his spirit. And it is God we must listen to. We only listen to men of God while they are preaching and teaching the word of God. Now, we must be generous. We must allow men and women of God some flexibility. There are cessationists who believe that the gifts of the Spirit are uh, uh, finished with the, the Apostles, who are great men and women of God. There are uh, Pentecostals who believe in the gifts of the Spirit, including prophecy and miracles and, and, and healing, who are great men and women of God. And then there are my favourites, the, the, the man in the middle, the men in the middle, like, like uh, um, here in this church we would say definitely uh, John Piper and, and Wayne Grudem and, uh, um, and others that, uh, like David Platt, uh, who, are, um, you know, who are theologically very, very sound, but also are very open for the gifts of the Spirit. But it is God that we listen to. And there will come a time where Piper, and, uh, and, 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 and Grudem will come to the end of themselves. But God is still there teaching. We will come to the end of our wisdom. We will come to the end of our, of our knowledge. And then we have mystery. The mystery of God. The things that we don't understand. The things that we haven't quite uh, grasped yet. So we must be flexible. But as long as men and women are wanting to know the truth of God's word and have a humility and a teachable spirit, uh, then that is fine. 
But it is God we must listen to. And when we look at men and attempted to, to exalt them, God says, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What is the house that you would build for me? And what is the place of my rest? All these things my hand has made. And so all these things came to be, declares the Lord. But this is the one to whom I will look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. It's God speaking to, to our hearts. It's God speaking about obedience. Obedience to his word and obedience to God. As God speaks to our hearts. Obedience is not always easy. We want to obey God. And yet there are times when it is difficult to obey God. It's God speaking about submission, about giving glory to God and submitting our own desires and our own, uh, I, I don't know, our, our own uh, um, wants and wishes and ambitions to God. And submitting ourselves to Him. It's God speaking about humility. God loves submission. He loves obedience and He loves humility. It's the proud spirit that God doesn't like. And that's putting it mildly. It's God speaking to us about our lifestyle. If you're coming to Meralka, that's one of our subjects. The Christian lifestyle. It's God speaking to us men about the internet. It's God speaking to all of us about movies and TV and gossip and the internet and, and modest dress. And, uh, and these things that, that constitute the Christian lifestyle. Because God wants to create in us an awe. He wants to create in us a, a sense of His greatness. A sense of His mystery. This is what God spoke to me on, on Wednesday. God is doing something very quiet and something that is hidden from many. But it is awesome and it is supernatural. He's calling to himself a small, holy remnant of humble, quiet, committed Christians. And there is a quiet revolution going on today that is unseen to many in the church. God is calling you out to live pure, devoted lives as a remnant that he is going to use for his glory. It will be made up of handmaidens of the Lord and servants of God, who are ordinary Christians who are seeking God just as God is seeking them. God is giving birth to a new holy remnant. In every generation, when the church backslides and becomes worldly and compromising, God raises up a people for himself. God will always call a people to himself who are a people after his own heart. God has always had a humble, praying people that want to glorify Him above everything else. And He is doing that in our generation today. And as we pray to God and place our lives on the altar for Him, He will use your life in a mighty way to glorify Him. He's calling a remnant of young men and women to a life of holiness, consecration, brokenness, humility and separation from the spirit of this world. And you are going to seek God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. And you're going to feel the pain and sorrow that God feels over a backslidden, unholy, and disobedient church. And you will suffer. And you will be misunderstood even by some of your Christian friends. You will have people accuse you of being narrow and legalistic. You will have people laugh at your holiness. But as you pray to God to dedicate your life completely to God, He's going to honour your prayer. God is going to do miracles in your life. You are yearning for an outpouring of holiness and righteousness in your church. And God will honour your desire to see the glory of the Lord descending on your life and in his church. For God is looking for a people who are seeking his glory above their glory. A people who will not compromise the word of God. A people who will have nothing to do 
with a Bible watered down to please men. A people who would not have a culturally relevant gospel that saves no one. And God is raising you up to know his voice and hear directly from him. God will not tolerate sin in his house. God will show you his hatred of sin in his house. God will show you his hatred of compromise in the ministry. And there will be a cleansing in your life. God will deal with your sin. God will deal with your weaknesses. God will deal with your anger and your compromise. And God will sanctify you. He will sanctify your lips. He will sanctify your mind. He will sanctify your heart. He will sanctify your temper and your instability. For we are living in the last days. And these times will be fearful and sinful as men's hearts become cold and there is a spirit of compromise in the church. But God is raising up a holy remnant who will be a holy, set apart, faithful, steadfast and true people. God will place divine principles in your soul, principles of truth, honour and integrity. Seek his face. Allow God to deal with your sin. Get into the Bible. Get alone with God. Learn to be a woman of God and a woman of the word. Learn the beauty of servant leadership and become a true man of God. For God has promised to bless the humble and contrite heart. God has promised to bless all those who tremble at his word. And find friends, others who are called out by God to be a holy remnant today. Those who are nothing, those who are despised, those who are mourning over their own lives, God will raise up. God will take hold of you. God will anoint you. God will open doors for you. God will stir your heart and you will know God and you will know God's voice. And God will use you to glorify his name. You may never have a name that is known by the world, but you will glorify God's name by your lips, through your heart and by your life. You will never have the recognition of the world, but you will have the recognition of God. You will live in this world, but you will live for the future, and not just for today. And your reward will be great, because it will be said of you that you were faithful to God. Amen.